disseminated intravascular coagulation. Okay, disseminated intravascular coagulation. This is a new topic for us. And this is not a new term at all. Uh, all medical student, okay, they have heard this term before. Uh, this is a very serious condition. This can be considered as a secondary, you know, uh, condition which is caused by many primary disorders or diseases. This is not a primary diagnosis. This is a secondary diagnosis. Means some causes has to be there which leads to DIC. Now, there is a one term which is synonymously used for disseminated intravascular coagulation. And what is the, what is the, the you know, name of that term? What is the name of that condition which is synonymous to DIC? Yes. Consumption coagulopathy. Exactly. Abbas is absolutely right. This is consumption coagulopathy. Consumption coagulopathy. Okay. In this class also, I will highlight this many times. Let's move further. So now let's start uh, this uh, topic with some physiology. Okay. This physiology. Every student knows this already. Now please focus here. This is the coagulation cascade or coagulation pathway. You see this. So we have three important, you know, uh, coagulation pathway. Some of the textbook mentioned like this. Uh, some, some of the textbook mentioned just two pathway, okay? Now, how, why three and why two? See that? Intrinsic pathway is one. Extrinsic pathway is another one. And common pathway is the third one. Uh, but if we do not consider common pathway, then intrinsic and extrinsic become two. Whatever way you answer, that will be nice. But proper explanation has to be there. So see that factor 12, factor 11, factor 9, factor 8, all of these are involved in the extrinsic pathway side. Okay. And ultimately, factor 10 would be activated. And that activated factor 10 will convert prothrombin, that is factor 2, into thrombin. And thrombin will convert fibrinogen into fibrin clot. So I'm explaining this in a very easy way, okay? It is not that easy as we, we, we talked about here. Let's move further. On the other hand, there is extrinsic pathway, okay? Tissue factor will start that pathway, then factor seven, then it again join the common pathway and from common pathway, it is the same thing. Now, one very important point, which is asked in your exam is, how we measure the function of intrinsic pathway, okay, and the extrinsic pathway. It is by partial thromboplastin time or activated partial thromboplastin time regarding the intrinsic pathway and prothrombin time regarding the extrinsic pathway. Let's move further. Another one, you can see here, all of you please focus. The same thing again, okay? Now already got the concept. So this is slightly a bit detail actually. Now these three pathway, three pathway, intrinsic pathway, extrinsic pathway, common pathway. So intrinsic pathway starts from the, you know, uh, surface contact, that means exposure of the collagen, okay? And then factor 12 will be converted into active factor 12, 11. Active factor 11, A means active form of the factor, 9 into 9A, okay? Then 10 will be converted into 10A. Now this, after this, it, it will be the common pathway because the extrinsic pathway also ends exactly here. Then common pathway will start and prothrombin will be converted into thrombin. And this thrombin will convert fibrinogen into fibrin. This fibrin, okay, is the stable clot. This fibrin is the stable clot. Now, intrinsic pathway is measured by partial thromboplastin time. Extrinsic pathway is measured by prothrombin time. And these are the different names of those factor, okay? Please uh, go through them. Not very commonly asked in the exam, but sometimes some of the MCQ exam may ask this question as well. Now, before I move further, a sm small, uh, you know, uh, explanation regarding our coagulation system. 
Now, if we develop some cut, okay, if we develop some cut or if there is some injury, how bleeding will stop? How bleeding will stop? Let me explain that. In the beginning, there is vasoconstriction. That vasoconstriction is done by activation of sympathetic nervous system along with some local factor. Now, that will control the amount of bleeding there. The second step regarding the hemostasis is done by platelet plug formation. It is platelet plug formation. Now, the platelet will come into the action now. Okay, They stick together, then they form a plug. This platelet plug is called temporary okay, hemostasis. It is not, not the you know, permanent one because it can be dislodged very easily. Later on, this platelet plug is strengthened by fibrin clot formation. And the coagulation pathway into, comes into picture for the formation of fibrin clot. This is an absolutely important concept for all of you. So let me repeat again. First is vasoconstriction, which decreases the amount of bleeding. Second, platelet plug formation. And third, fibrin clot formation. Fibrin clot is the stable type of clot. Now, see here, okay, FDP, fibrin degradation product. This fibrin degradation product would be uh, produced when fibrinogen is converted into fibrin. Now we'll talk about the importance of this later on in the diagnosis of DIC. In DIC, these fibrin degradation products are increasingly found in the blood. So see here now, let's move on, okay? I'll go very slowly and we'll talk a lot of important things on the way. Now this is intrinsic pathway. Many of the students have the idea already. See here, it is activated in response to blood coming in contact with the exposed collagen in the blood vessel wall. That is how the intrinsic pathway would be activated. Okay. For example, if the endothelium is damaged, there will be exposed collagen there. Okay. This factor 12 comes in contact with that, then intrinsic pathway will be started. Now, what about the extrinsic pathway? Now, this pathway is initiated due to damage to the epithelial cells of the body, which leads to release of tissue factor, which leads to release of tissue factor. That is tissue thromboplastin. Now, this tissue thromboplastin is also known as tissue factor. Don't get confused, so, which is uh, actually a factor three. It is released by those damaged tissue and then it will start the extrinsic pathway of coagulation. Then factor seven will be involved, okay? Then with the help of factor five, it will uh, join the common pathway and convert 10 into active factor 10. And after that, everything is already talked about. So this is extrinsic pathway. Now, the common pathway is the third one. Both the intrinsic and extrinsic pathway, both the extrinsic and the intrinsic pathway, they end with the conversion of factor 10 into factor 10A, means active form of factor 10. This is the point. And at this point, they enter the common pathway where prothrombin is converted to thrombin. And this thrombin then converts fibrinogen to fibrin. And this fibrin, after it cross link with other fibrin, it will form the stable type of blood clot. Then there will be permanent type of hemostasis. So this is the meaning. Okay. So still, if some students are confused here, okay, then they should go back, open their physiology book and pathology book. Okay study this in detail until and unless they are quite sure about it. Now let's move on. See here, this slide is about the fibrin clot. This fibrin clot already discussed actually is the final product of hemostasis. 
it is considered stable when attached to the vascular wall and it is considered a thrombus when it is floating around in the vasculature now there is a very subtle difference between a fibrin clot which is physiological one and thrombus which is a pathological one now let me uh, give explanation once again if there is you know cut to the blood vessel wall okay if there is a cut to the tissue the fibrin clot has to be formed for the hemostasis this is physiological but if there is a minor damage to the endothelium the bleeding has not occurred there okay bleeding has not occurred only the minor damage occur in the endothelium then there is collagen exposure there and after that the platelet will go there and attach the coagulation cascade will come into the picture and they will form relatively larger type of blood clot which is you know a bit of obstructing the blood flow there actually speaking this type of physiology is not necessary now isn't because there is no bleeding right so uh, this is known as thrombus and this thrombus can be easily detached and turned into embolus you can clearly see in this picture now this is a stable clot okay which is attached on that wall okay tightly attached to the wall and this thrombus okay is probably loosely attached to the wall and most of it is blocking the blood flow into the lumen of the blood vessel so this thrombus now with this background knowledge let's start our discussion on dic disseminated intravascular coagulation now this dic is all about inappropriate and accelerated systemic activation of coagulation cascade now see here this is very inappropriate and this is accelerated systemic activation of coagulation cascade now whenever the coagulation cascade terms comes we remember those three pathway quickly intrinsic pathway extrinsic pathway and the common pathway okay and before that also the platelet will also come in the picture remember platelet plug always forms before the fibrin clot now after the coagulation system is massively activated throughout the body what will happen now what is the end product of the coagulation pathway it's a fibrin clot formation so there is multiple clot formation throughout the body in case of dic now there is a problem to form the clot what we need yes what we need to form the clot fibrin 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 sir and the coagulation factors exactly then it very easy question now any student can can yeah. answer this we need platelet okay to form the platelet plug and to form the stable type of clot we need clotting factors right from fibrinogen to all other factor now they are consumed remember this they are consumed they are used up now the amount of those clotting factor and the platelet will be less in the blood now that can lead to bleeding that can lead to bleeding so this condition is a very difficult one in this same condition some area of our body are actively developing clot or thrombus and some other areas of our body are bleeding now as a result of lack of those factors that's why it is known as consumption coagulopathy what may be the cause for this this class is all about that but this is the introductory slide so i have mentioned some of the important points here this dic follows sepsis any types of serious sepsis okay leads to dic massive blood transfusion can lead to dic and a lot of obstetrics complication can also lead to dic some of those you have recently studied 
I want the answer here. Which obstetric complication lead to DIC? Yes. Sir, it may be amniotic fluid embolism, preeclampsia, abruptus placenta, and uh, retained uh, placenta previous or abruptus placenta. Very good, excellent answer. I already got and all those answers are absolutely correct. Okay, so all of the students, please listen carefully. The obstetric complications, the common one are retained dead fetus, retained dead fetus inside, or you can also call it as a missed abortion. Okay, retained dead fetus is the term when that baby die after 20 weeks of gestation. And missed abortion is when the baby died before 20 weeks, but it has not come out. It is still staying inside. That is number one. Number two, abruptio placenta. When the placenta prematurely separate from the uterine wall, abruptio placenta, very important cause of DIC. Number three, amniotic fluid embolism. The amniotic fluid, if it enters into the blood circulation, it can, okay, it can lead to DIC. Another one is a septic abortion. Yesterday, okay, probably you have talked about that septic abortion. This infection in the uterine cavity can also lead to uh, uh, this particular condition called DIC, okay? These are few of the, uh, you know, obstetric complications. Very, very important question in any exam. Now, DIC is a red flag for a severe underlying disorders. And DIC is not a primary diagnosis, it is a secondary diagnosis. That's what I told you before. If DIC is developed by a patient, then you always consider this patient must be having something else in the body and that cause is leading to DIC. Let's move on. Now, what are the causes of DIC? So please focus on the slide. Now DIC is not a primary diagnosis. It is always a response to a primary disease process that cause an inflammatory response and they include sepsis. Severe type of infection can lead to DIC. Major trauma, major trauma in the body. It may be multiple fracture, okay? Multiple fracture caused by road traffic accident or earthquake victim or something like that. It may be the complication of pregnancy, which we just listed. Large vascular aneurysm, okay? Large vascular aneurysm. A good example we can give is abdominal aortic aneurysm. Abdominal aortic aneurysm is an example of very big type of aneurysm there. The causes can be anything like atherosclerotic aneurysm. Cephalitic aneurysm, like that. Neoplastic diseases, any cases of cancer, okay? Any cases of especially epithelial type of cancer and even, even, okay, blood cancer. Blood cancer is not a proper term. We should call it leukemia because we are healthcare personnel. We should talk like a, like a proper medical term, isn't it? So we, leukemia, we call it. But layman call it blood cancer. Now, one small question here. Which type of leukemia is commonly associated with DIC? Anybody? Sir, it's uh, uh, related with acute coromyelocytic leukemia. Excellent. Very good answer. Okay. He is absolutely correct. It is acute promyelocytic leukemia. This is M3. known as M3. Very good. It is M3. It is a type of myeloid leukemia, AML, M3, acute promyelocytic leukemia, which is associated very commonly with DIC. Excellent. So these are the neoplastic diseases. Now, if, if there is an organ failure, okay, organ failure like acute hepatocellular failure, it can lead to DIC. Severe type of transfusion reaction or massive type of blood transfusion can also lead to DIC. Some of the vascular abnormality, one of, one of the important example I can give here, okay, is a big hemangioma, which is formed. Now, what is hemangioma? 
Tumor of the blood. Tumor of the blood vessel. Yes. Okay. Every student know this. Very easy question. Okay. So we don't ask a difficult question all the time. Remember this. Sometimes very easy question can be asked, and the students should think about it and answer pro properly. Hemangioma is a benign tumor which develops from blood vessels. There are three types of hemangioma. According to the types of blood vessel, arterial hemangioma, okay, cavernous hemangioma means venous, and capillary hemangioma. So if those hemangioma are quite big, they can consume a lot of clotting factors inside them. They can consume a lot of platelets inside them. They can cause a situation like DIC. It is known as Kasabak Merritt syndrome. Okay, later on we'll we'll talk about this. Okay, don't worry now. Kasabak Merritt syndrome is the name. Toxic reaction, toxic reaction, okay, can cause DIC. Heat stroke can cause DIC. This is a very high temperature, very high temperature in the body, and actually the problem here is the person is unable to sweat. There is lack of sweating, which can lead to very high rise in temperature inside the body. Usually the temperature is quite high, more than 41 degree or 42 degree centigrade. Hyperthermia, okay, high grade temperature because of any infection, hemorrhagic skin necrosis, hemorrhagic skin necrosis, and catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome. Catastrophic means serious type. So all of these are the causes of DIC. All of these uh, may not be that important for you to remember. But try to remember at least four to five important causes. Let's move on. Now another important part of this class is about pathogenesis. Now how these causes lead to DIC? What is the mechanism? Now listen carefully here. A wide variety of triggers may cause release of thrombin. Into the circulation, with consequent formation of microthrombi. Now, all these triggers, what they do now, they activate the coagulation cascade. They activate uh, those three coagulation pathway, and ultimately, thrombin will be formed, and that thrombin will convert fibrinogen into the fibrin. Now, this fibrin is a blood clot. If this fibrin is unnecessarily formed. We we don't want that fibrin to form at this stage. We don't want the fibrin to form at this stage. Remember that. But it is forming. Okay, it is forming unnecessarily. Now what will happen? There is formation of microthrombi in very small circulation of our body. That means capillary, and these microthrombi cause ischemia and necrosis. This is the main problem. In DIC, ischemia and necrosis of the different organ, especially brain, lung, liver, kidney, all these organs will suffer. At the same time, now our body has another important system. This is called fibrinolytic system. The body will try to dissolve this unnecessary fibrin clot, okay, to maintain the vascular potency. So that will also become activated. Now this fibrinolysis occur because of plasmin. This plasmin will dissolve this fibrin clot, and this is called fibrinolytic system. Now this is also going side by side, which will really help us regarding the diagnosis of DIC. Now look at this flow chart here. Okay. This is a underlying disorder. Now, few of the example. If I quickly ask this question, you can answer. Obstetrics complication, very easy. Severe sepsis, okay? Severe sepsis. Some organ failure in the body. Some some snake bite, okay? Some toxic reactions in the body, okay? So all these can be written here as the cause of DIC, which leads to systemic activation of coagulation. There is enhanced fibrin formation. There is microvascular thrombosis, which can lead to organ failure. On the other hand, there is consumption of platelet and clotting factors, 
which leads to deficiency of those. And when we need it, we don't have them now, and that can lead to bleeding. So at the same time, there is thrombus formation, and same time there is bleeding going on. This is called consumption coagulopathy. Now similar okay, type of mechanisms are explained here once again, so that you will get a clear concept right from the class. See here now, DIC is most commonly uh, initiated by a mixture of two insult. One is endothelial damage, another is pathological release of tissue factor. Now, if I go back, okay, to the coagulation cascade activation, I clearly told you that time, the intrinsic factor, okay, intrinsic factor is activated by the exposure of collagen and extrinsic factor is activated by tissue factor. The same thing is, is written here. Have a look here. Endothelial damage. This normal endothelium accumulates antithrombin and thrombomodulin, which prevents thrombosis. Now, this antithrombin 3 is a naturally occurring anticoagulant in our body. Now, anticoagulant means they don't allow the clot to form. These are naturally occurring substance. And there is, should be a good balance between clotting factor and anticoagulant factor. Then only the blood flow can become proper. Then only the potency of the blood vessel can be maintained. If there is a, a imbalance between this anticoagulant and procoagulant, we'll be in trouble. Now, if this endothelium is damaged, what will happen? It will expose the collagen. And, okay, it is a source of tissue factor which stimulates thrombosis. Rather than uh, this uh, tissue factor on this type, okay, this tissue factor is present everywhere in every tissue, isn't it? Collagen is also a type of tissue. That's why it is written here. But simply the exposure of collagen and stickiness of that factor 12 on the collagen will stimulate this intrinsic pathway and ultimately it will lead to clot formation and that is called thrombus. Now on the other hand, if tissue factor is released because of this tissue damage, because of the leukemic cell, because of amniotic fluid embolism and because of different cancers, another coagulation cascade will come into the picture that is extrinsic pathway, and ultimately both of these will, will cause activation of common pathway and lead to fibrin clot formation. Now, snake bite are a rare but often catastrophic cause of DIC. Now, these snakes are of different type. Okay, many of you may be quite interested to know a little bit about the snake bite. So let me give you a bit of information here. Okay, listen carefully. This snake can be mainly of three types according to the toxic effect. According to the toxic effect. The first type of snake are called neurotoxic snake. They have neurotoxin in them. Second are called hemotoxic. They can badly damage our hematology system. And these snake mainly causes DIG. The third are called myotoxic, they badly damage the muscle. I see that I'm making it very easy for you. Three important types of poisonous snake. The neurotoxic snake are cobra, cobra and karet. I'm sure you have heard the name. Even in Pakistan, they are quite common, isn't it? Yes, because- Yes, sir. Exactly, yes. Many, many tropical countries, the snake bites are quite common, okay? So karet and cobra, they are neurotoxic but they don't usually lead to DIC. The snake which cause DIC, okay, they are called viper, viper, okay, viper snake, they are called viperidae, like Russell's viper, this type of snake, and then third are called sea snake. They are found in, in the sea, in the water usually, they are myotoxic. So what they do, they can also lead to DIC. That's the point. Now, okay, 
before we go for the break i want all of you to focus on the screen so please have a look here see here let me quickly analyze this for you so these are okay the intrinsic pathway activation causes these are the extrinsic pathway activation causes this because of the endothelial injury it occurs because of the tissue factor release some of the causes trauma gram negative sepsis hypoxia acidosis shock and vasculitis on the other hand it is trauma mainly but some obstetric complication and some of the cancer may also lead the same now ultimately all of them release uh, causes thrombin generation okay this third this thrombin will convert fibrinogen into the fibrin and this is one of the main factor for thrombosis see here thrombosis as a result of this thrombosis there will be hemolytic anemia and tissue ischemia now you may be wondering what is the connection of thrombosis with hemolytic anemia now if you remember whenever you studied about different types of hemolytic anemia one of the type is called microangiopathic hemolytic anemia now what do you mean by that the very small capillaries they are having thrombi and when the rbc passes through those small capillary those rbcs will be a bit of damage you know and those damaged rbc would be removed by the spleen and reticular endothelial system leading to hemolytic anemia so this is the mechanism don't forget talking right now another is hus exactly what is the full form of hus hus hemolytic uremic syndrome the hemolytic uremic syndrome exactly hemolytic uremic syndrome this is a good example of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia another condition is ttp okay ttp thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura okay. so these are some of the important example of which your teacher may like to ask this these all of them uh, lead to hemolytic anemia in the similar fashion let's move on now now the second one as a result of this thrombin generation there is activation of the plasmin this plasmin will break down the fibrin clot so on that process some fibrin degradation product will be formed but this fibrin degradation product are also formed when fibrinogen is converted into fibrin so this is not the only mechanism for the synthesis of fibrin degradation product now during this mechanism platelets are also consumed because blood clot is forming everywhere leading to thrombocytopenia now see there what is the mechanism of bleeding in this case one is thrombocytopenia another is this plasmin which is breaking the clot okay and when clots are broken there is a high chance of bleeding and another is fibrin degradation product will okay inhibit the thrombin and platelet aggregation it can also contribute in the bleeding process so thrombosis and bleeding are the two important okay a uh, uh, thing which occur in a case of dic let's move further now let's talk about the clinical features of dic now every student can write some of the clinical features if this question is asked because you know what what is happening in a case of dic hemorrhage okay or bleeding thrombosis leading to different organ or tissue dysfunction 
so these are the mainly things so again i want to show you what important okay flow chart uh, this is slide and it uh, takes a bit of time to explain this but it is absolutely important a lot of knowledge is here okay so let me take a bit of time and explain this to you and see this so these are the causes sepsis cancer and trauma there are so many other okay but only the three causes are highlighted here which can lead to endothelial damage and that can start the clotting or coagulation cascade now what is the final product thrombin generation and this thrombin generation is much more than the naturally occurring antithrombotic pathway those naturally occurring antithrombotic pathway or factors are antithrombin 3 protein c and protein s antithrombin 3 protein c and protein s they are called naturally occurring anticoagulant in our body so thrombin generation is more than them in this condition now because of this thrombin generation there is consumption of platelet fibrinogen prothrombin and everything okay and then it will form a clot now because of this okay the clot will form definitely on the other hand all of these will also be consumed now what will happen to the patient okay we are talking about the clinical feature now we already know what is the pathogenesis now focus on the last part here petit ke okay weeping wound means some bleeding occurring from the wound area or the site ecchymosis bleeding from the mucous membrane all of these occur because of the lack of platelet mainly or the lack of clotting factors now petit ke are called pin head size bleeding of the skin and mucous membrane this is mainly occur because of lack of platelet ecchymosis means bluish discoloration okay it almost looks like a bruise but ecchymosis and bruise they are very different thing ecchymosis can occur even without trauma if there is severe thrombocytopenia but bruise always occur because of blunt trauma it is a rupture of blood vessel and after that the blood will leak into the subcutaneous space that is called bruise but both of them look bluish in color so we can be confused between them epistaxis is a very good example of bleeding from mucous membrane now what is epistaxis what is that blood no sperm uh, bleeding from the nose exactly bleeding from the nose is called epistaxis so similarly bleeding can also occur in the urine bleeding can also occur in the gi tract so these are some other example now as a result of this widespread deposition of fibrin there is tissue ischemia now see there the effect on different organ acute renal failure hepatic dysfunction stroke and pulmonary disease now all of these can happen in a case of dic and if your examiner asks can we explain why this this uh, organ failure occurs or organ dysfunction occur the answer is very easy because in dic there is widespread deposition of fibrin in a small blood vessels so multiple organ dysfunction can occur like renal failure hepatic dysfunction stroke okay stroke is neurological deficit because of either ischemia okay or hemorrhage inside the brain and pulmonary disease are the lung dysfunction now the another thing which i was discussing just now is microangiopathic hemolytic anemia the mechanism for this is again blockage of those small blood vessels when rbc passes through them those rbc are partially damaged on their membrane as a result of this different clinical feature will be there okay this is called microangiopathic hemolytic anemia now on this condition cystocyte are seen in blood smear this is a typical appearance of the rbc a cystocyte cum test is negative here if we do because cum test is only positive in autoimmune hemolytic anemia so all of these are important point now i want you to focus on this part 
though we, we will talk about this later on. The associated lab result or lab value in case of DIC are there is increase or prolongation of prothrombin time. There is prolongation of partial thromboplastin time. There is decrease of platelet. There is decrease in fibrinogen. There is increase in D dimer or FDP. And if we take the peripheral blood smear, we can see the evidence of hemolytic anemia. All those cystocytes or damaged RBCs are seen. And the confirmation of the diagnosis is done by fibrin degradation product as well as D dimer assay. Okay, now later on, when we talk about uh, the investigation, I'll explain all these mechanisms one after other. Please, please mute yourself. Okay, mute yourself. Now let's talk about what are the types of DIC. What are the types of DIC? You can easily include this in your clinical feature. If any question is asked from DIC, and uh, if that question uh, comes uh, right about the clinical features of DIC, you can easily mention these types in that clinical feature answer. Now, regarding the types, okay, non-overt DIC and overt DIC, acute DIC and chronic DIC, these are the different ones. Now, non-overt means the the investigations are showing the features of DIC, but clinical features are still not there in the patient. Now, listen once again, non-overt, the investigations are showing the features of DIC, like there is prolongation of bleeding time and clotting time. There is decreased platelet, decreased fibrinogen, but till now, the bleeding manifestations has not occurred. So non-overt. Overt means both. Clinical features are also there, lab values are also supporting it. So again, divide into controlled and uncontrolled variety. We'll talk about that. And acute DIC and chronic DIC depends on the duration. Now see here, these are non-overt and overt DIC. Now all of you, please focus here. This is what I just explained. In non-overt, the lab tests are positive, but clinical features are negative. It is not obvious type of DIC. Overt means it is not very apparent or obvious. The lab features are still not there. Okay, and it will be developed in the patient if there is compensated hemostatic system. But after some time, probably, okay, the clinical features will occur. Overt DIC means lab tests are also positive and clinical features are also positive. Now, in this condition, there is decompensated hemostatic system. That's why, okay, that's why the clinical features are already there. It is further divided into controlled and uncontrolled variety based on whether the process will resolve when the underlying condition is removed. A good example I can give here is obstetrics causes. After the dead fetus is removed from the uterine cavity, okay, the DIC will resolve. The lady will, will come back to the normal, normal life. So this is called control type. And uncontrolled, even after treating the original disease or cause, which is leading DIC, it is still going on that has to be uncontrolled. And it is mainly seen in severe type sepsis. The third one is the acute DIC, acute. Now this acute type of DIC is of shorter duration and it is a very serious one. Now see here, when we uh, explain uh, about it, then you know what I was talking about here. In this condition, the bleeding occurring from the vein puncture site and even the surgical wound. Normally, there should not be any bleeding from this puncture site or surgical wound. Okay, If our coagulation cascade system is working properly, if we have good amount of platelet in our system, 
then there should not be any bleeding from the vein puncture site and surgical wound. But this is altogether a very pathological condition. That's why it is happening here. In this condition, there is grayish discoloration of tips of the finger, toes, and ears in a symmetrical distribution. Now, can you tell me why there is grayish discoloration of this tip of the finger, toes, and ears in this case? What may be the mechanism? Necrosis, you dyskemia. Exactly. Okay. Absolutely correct. Because of the ischemia. And ischemia is very common in this condition. You all know the mechanism because of thrombosis. Because of thrombosis. thrombosis exactly. Because of thrombosis of those small blood vessels. So the blood cannot flow to these, these areas. As a result of that, in the beginning, there would be a little bit bluish to grayish. Okay. Bluish to grayish. Absolutely correct. One of the important examples of acute DIC is seen in meningococcemia. Meningococcemia, and that is known as purpura fulminans. This is an important question which can be asked in different exam. Please have a note here. Purpura fulminans is a feature of meningococcemia. Which bacteria is responsible here? Sunnesera and Nesera meningitis. Exactly. I'm sure every student knows this. Meningococci is the another name for Neisseria meningitis. So let me write that for you here. Nigeria meningitis. Okay, meningitis. See there. So this is the organism which is known as meningococci. This is a highly virulent organism. This organism can lead to meningococcemia, which is, uh, you know, presence of this organism in the blood with active sign and symptom, and this can quickly result in septic shock. Another infection which is caused by this organism is meningitis. Meningitis. This is a type of pyogenic or bacterial meningitis. Remember these two important infection caused by Nigeria meningitis. Okay, killer bacteria. Both of these infections are very serious. Now, in meningococcemia, there is bleeding from the GI tract, gingival bleeding, epistaxis, pulmonary hemorrhage, and hematuria. See here, the, most of the uh, mucous membrane in our body are having bleeding. So, a serious type of condition. Now, one small question. This meningococcemia also damages one endocrine organ in our body. Which endocrine organ is that? The brain gland. It's called the brain. 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 The I got the answers already. Okay, I got it. Somebody is saying adrenal gland. Exactly, adrenal gland. Now listen here. This mm -hmm. adrenal glands are necrosed bilaterally. This is known as. Please. Oh, one. Please. Who is that? I'm muting all of you, okay, because that that is causing a big, big problem for all of us, okay? My whole, whole when when I'm explaining something and if this type of disturbance comes, you know, I'll completely, you know, disturbed here. Now, let me refocus again. I was talking about purpura fulminans, which is caused by meningococcemia. This is Nigeria meningitis, a very uh, virulent type of bacteria. This bacteria causes Pyogenic or bacterial meningitis as another type of infection in the body. At the same time, adrenal gland, okay, adrenal gland are also uh, damaged by meningococcemia. Okay, this is known as bilateral hemorrhagic. Okay, hemorrhagic infarction. 
of adrenal gland bilateral hemorrhagic infarction of adrenal glands now we we use a special term for that that is called waterhouse frederickson syndrome waterhouse k fred friction syndrome never forget this these are some of the extra information for you whenever you talk about meningococcemia waterhouse frederickson syndrome let's move on now the common causes of acute dic regarding uh, uh, this disease are infection mainly the gram negative bacteremia will cause dic okay gram negative bacteremia or gram negative sepsis are more common uh, to cause dic than gram positive sepsis probably because of the endotoxin which the gram negative bacteria produce that is responsible for the causation of dic now gram negative septicemia now quickly okay once again give me some of the example of gram negative bacteria yes gram negative bacteria you can take any name here what are those very good very good so many student absolutely okay so see there i'm just stimulating all of you to go through this important part so this is the easiest of the question give me the example some of the gram negative bacteria i'll start from kokai and nigeria is the perfect example of gram negative kokai the one which we are just discussing nigeria meningitis as well as nigeria gonorrhea these are gram negative kokai now gram negative bacilli are so many any name you can take pseudomonas klebsiella proteus e coli okay many different types are there now systemic fungal infection okay malaria viral hemorrhagic fever even herpes virus and influenza are rare causes of dic but sometimes they can lead to dic so especially a type of malaria which is the most serious type what is the name which is the most serious type of malaria plasmodium falciparum plasmodium falciparum very good the malaria which is caused by plasmodium falciparum is called malignant type of malaria or most severe type of malaria dic is one of the complication there that's why malaria is written here systemic fungal infection if it is serious one viral hemorrhagic fever a serious type of viral hemorrhagic fever one of the example is dengue fever a dengue hemorrhagic fever ebola virus okay it also leads to hemorrhagic fever okay so these are some of the good example here herpes virus herpes simplex a serious type of infection not ordinary and influenza there are rare causes of dic so not always think only bacterial infection can lead to dic sometimes even viral other parasite or even fungal infection can lead to dic let's move on now the other causes of acute dic would be obstetric complication or obstetric catastrophe means serious stages or conditions like abrupt placenta with amniotic fluid embolism another one retained dead fetus you can easily include it here septic abortion you can include here missed abortion so all these uh, can be written very confidently one important point after we evacuate the uterus then okay there is no more clinical features of dic left so obstetrics catastrophe if we identify early then dic can be treated in time now another causes of acute dic are endothelial damage can be caused by burns okay burns a severe type of burns sunstroke and electric shock so all of these can start the abnormal activation of coagulation cascade by damaging endothelium incompatible blood transfusion is another important cause of acute dic 
Now it is known as ABO incompatibility. And this is also known as mismatch blood transfusion. Mismatch. Now, for example, okay, a person who is A positive. Let's talk a little bit here. The person is A positive. Now tell me which type of blood can this person receive? Which blood? A positive. A positive. A positive. A positive. A negative. Or oh, negative. Okay. Good. I'm I'm getting uh, correct answers here. So for example, if this person is A positive, he can definitely get A positive blood. There's no doubt about it. It is the same blood group. Another is he can also get A negative blood. He can also get A negative blood. Okay. And he can also get O negative blood. See there. He can easily get these three blood groups. A positive, A negative, and O negative. Now, sometime what happens, the doctor do some mistakes in the hospital or the lab person do some mistake. They, they wrongly uh, gave the blood report and they wrongly give us the, you know, uh, we, we, before transfusing the blood, okay, we want to check whether this blood can be transfused to this patient or not. During that process, if some mistakes occur, then we give a wrong blood to that patient and there will be a serious reaction between the antibody which are already there in the blood of this patient and the antigen which we are giving from outside. This is known as mismatch blood transfusion. A fatal type of hemolytic anemia can happen and that can uh, start the process of DIC. Now, two, two important question which, which can be asked by any teacher here. Who are the universal acceptor? Universal acceptor regarding the blood transfusion? AB positive. AB positive. AB positive. Excellent. AB positive. Very good. AB positive. And I am AB positive, by the way. Okay, so I can accept any blood group in emergency situation. And who are the universal donor? Who are the negative. universal donor? O negative. O negative. O negative. Very good. Negative. They are O negative. Okay. So please uh, remember. And at the same time, you should always do a little bit of exercise uh, among yourselves. If that particular blood group comes, which are the blood group I can allow? Otherwise, it will be considered as a criminal negligence if ABO incompatibility occurs in the hospital and you are responsible for that. Now, hepatic disease can also result in acute DIC and some of the examples are acute hepatic necrosis or acute fatty liver of pregnancy. So even acute hepatocellular damage can result in acute DIC. So these are some of the causes of acute DIC. Now, let's see some of the picture here before we move further. All of you, please focus here. Now, you should know how to, how to describe, okay, whatever you see here. So this uh, patient is a child. You can see from the face, okay. The patient is a child and see very carefully what is happening on the face, okay. There is already a discoloration of the skin. Okay. These are called necrotic type of rashes, hemorrhagic and necrotic rash. This is highly typical of meningococcemia, also known as purpura fulminans. These are the different purpuric rashes, but they are hemorrhagic as well as necrotic. There is a bit of bleeding occurring from the oral cavity probably, and uh, a lot of the other areas in the body are also having similar type lesion. So this is a spot diagnosis. If a baby or if, if any adult comes like this in the hospital and if they are very sick, think about meningococcemia. If I fail to diagnose this condition, the patient will die within 24 hours. 
just one day we lose this patient because of septic shock this is the importance of knowing these type of cases this is the importance of knowing proper knowledge being a doctor is not that easy if i fail to diagnose this and because of my incompetency if this baby die i cannot forgive myself so this is the point here okay so this type of serious cases you need to focus well if i do not know i should con consult my senior i should consult my friend quickly and do not uh, think that you know everything you don't need to consult other people that is a very wrong type of attitude in our practice this is called purpura fulminans caused by meningococcemia now the other type of dic is chronic dic let's talk about it this chronic dic is not as serious as the acute dic but it is associated with so many other pathology or causes and it will help us to find out those pathology or causes that is important point here so let's move further so in this case there are superficial and extensive ecchymosis of extremity which may be intermittent or can persist for a long time so ecchymosis means bluish patches and these bluish patches are mainly developed because of thrombocytopenia there would be recurrent episodes of epistaxis or internal mucosal bleeding epistaxis is a nasal bleeding which we can see from outside but internal mucosal bleeding like bleeding inside the lung bleeding in the gi tract bleeding in the urinary tract it can also come outside okay but it may a uh, uh, persist there for some time and then come outside so we may think like that one of the sign which is associated with epithelial cancer in case of gi tract is trussu sign okay trussu sign this trussu sign is recurrent migratory thrombophlebitis in association with cancer especially the epithelial cell cancer of the gi tract mainly in adult one of the good example i can give you is pancreatic cancer trussu sign a very important mcq question in the exam please note it another one there is impairment of renal function there is impairment okay of brain function which results in confusion and there is repeated episodes of cerebral thrombosis in case of chronic dic now before we uh, finish this class let's talk about the common causes of chronic dic now just go through them one of them is adenocarcinoma adenocarcinoma this adenocarcinoma is what i'm talking just now epithelial cell cancer of the gi tract it can lead to thrombophlebitis migrans or trussu syndrome this trussu syndrome is a recurrent venous thromboembolism which is a migratory type very commonly seen in pancreatic cancer and other epithelial cancer of the gi tract in adult now why it happens there because it can lead to tissue damage because of different metastasis it can lead to secretion of tissue factor or secretion of some other procoagulants itself and procoagulants almost act like a coagulation factors the second can be a retained dead fetus syndrome a retained dead fetus syndrome this is a obstetric cause initially this is a low grade dic but the same cause i can write in acute dic also it depends when am i diagnosing it in the beginning probably a low grade or chronic type of dic and if the baby is not removed in time then fulminant or acute setting of dic can happen other causes of chronic dic's are liver disease and some of the localized lesion now regarding the liver disease coagulopathy is characteristics of liver disease and dic may play a part there 
Now, one small question I I'd like to ask you: Why, in serious type of liver disease, there is high chance of bleeding disorder? What is the explanation? Sir, because of deficiency of coagulation in the liver, sir. Many important factors in the liver, sir. There is no problem in the liver disease, sir. There will be no sign the signs of the uh, clotting factor. You do, sir. There will be no clotting and hemorrhage will occur. Exactly. All of the students, okay, I can clearly, uh, you know, hear your voices there. Though it is a bit of overlapping, but still I can find out. Good answer. Liver has one very important function regarding the coagulation cascade. It is synthesizing some of the clotting factors like two, seven, nine, and ten. So let me write them here. Okay, two. Seven, nine, and ten. These are the clotting factor which are synthesized by liver, and the activation of these, okay, inactive clotting factor in the presence of vitamin K is also done by liver. So you can also mention it here. So in any case of liver disease, you know, uh, coagulopathy is very common. Another one, the localized lesions like aneurysm, already talked about. Hemangioma or big type of hemangioma, which can cause accumulation or consumption of clotting factor inside it, as well as platelet, and that can simply lead to deficiency of those clotting factor and platelet, and this is a part of DIC, and this type of condition is known as Casabac Merritt syndrome. Okay, Casabac Merritt syndrome. So remember uh, this name here. This is a very important point. So let me underline it for you. Casabac Merritt syndrome. If they ask you, just answer like this. This is a big hemangioma. Just all of you, just have a look at this. Uh, you know, picture now. See this. There is a bleeding happening. See, this is look like a. You know, what is it called? Let me ask you a question. What you call this? This type of appearance? Yes. Anyone? Impression. Ichmosis. Ichymosis. Very good. Ichymosis. It is called. Now somebody is telling me this is abrasion. Sorry, a bruise. Okay. A bruise and ichymosis almost looks like same. Bruise and ichymosis almost looks like same. But bruise is caused by blunt force. Or blunt trauma, which is not by sharp weapon at all. Blunt injury leads to bruise. It is because of rupture of the blood vessels in the subcutaneous area. But ichymosis is a feature of bleeding disorder, like DIC. Now let's move on. Let's talk about what are the specific features of DIC in neonate and infant. What are the causes of DIC first in neonate and infant? Let's talk about this, and then we we'll move on to the clinical features. This is caused by transplacental passage of thromboplastin or other pro-coagulant substance in the neonate who are born to mother affected with DIC. Now see there, the mother should have DIC first, and mothers usually have DIC as some of the problem of pregnancy. We already know that, like abruptio placentae, eclampsia, or even septicemia. Okay, eclampsia is another important cause of DIC. Eclampsia means pregnancy-induced hypertension with, with you know, seizure. This is you know, uh, eclampsia. So, what what happened here? There is transplacental passage of thromboplastin towards the baby, and the baby may develop DIC. Now, development of DIC in a twin fetus may be due to fetofetal passage of thromboplastin. If one baby, okay, is having some problem like DIC, or one baby is dead, probably something like that, then another may also develop DIC. DIC can occur secondary to hemangioma. One of the important example we discuss is Casabac Merritt syndrome. So, similar type of situation may be there. Now, the precipitating factors for the development of DIC would be asphyxia, septicemia, and eclampsia. Asphyxia means hypoxic situation in the newborn. Now, what are the clinical features? There would be 
symmetric ecchymosis of lower extremities and buttock area ecchymosis blue patches it's a type of bleeding disorder later these lesion may become necrotic as well and some of them may become blood filled bulla now bulla is a is a giant vesicle bulla is a giant vesicle which has, is filled with blood here but not always bulla can be filled with air as well or sometimes even with other type of fluid but in this case it is mainly blood and it may be necrotic sometimes so these are important point there is sharply circumscribed infarct of skin and genitalia now why infarction and necrosis develops in dic what's the mechanism yes blockage of the exactly okay rayman is answering back quite correctly this is because of blockage of small blood vessel as a result of thrombosis okay there is blockage of the blood vessel which can result in infarction and gangrene also if that inf uh, if that blockage is very severe one fever and prostration may be common prostration means a situation of extreme weakness that that a newborn behave like or that baby behaves like he, he or she cannot even move okay this is called prostration and mortality is quite high this is a serious condition almost 40 to 70 percent of the time that kid who has a dic may die regarding the treatment okay heparin or anticoagulant substance or drug is an important one and relapse is common after we stop heparin therapy so difficult situation to handle let's move on okay now look at this uh, picture these are the bulla which are seen in dic you see this this bulla they, they have blood inside okay. they have blood inside and they are bigger than vesicle so these are called bulla vesicle means a small blister which is less than five millimeter in size that is vesicle bulla is bigger than that now we have reached to a very important part of uh, today's lecture that is a diagnosis of dic now this is a very very important question in many exam okay so please i want more attention here no single test diagnoses dic so we do a battery of test or multiple test and a clinical picture leads to diagnosis of dic now clinical picture alone may not be enough clinical picture will give you a hint and that is confirmed by investigation that's what we are learning in clinical medicine always start with the history taking examine the patient after that and confirm everything by investigation never jump now what are the important lab test okay in case of dic let's talk about it now see this platelet count fdp or d dimer pt or ptt fibrinogen and antithrombin 3 and protein c level now platelet count is always decrease in a case of dic because of consumption fdp fibrin degradation product fibrin degradation product now fibrin is the final product of coagulation pathway we all know that fibrinogen converts into fibrin with the help of thrombin now during this conversion some of the you know degradation factors or products are called fibrin degradation product this is a very important point and this is known as d dimer assay so these are almost the same thing pt is prothrombin time ptt is partial thromboplastin time now can you tell me pt and ptt measures which coagulation pathway yes PUD bar extrinsic 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 exactly so many students know this quite confidently because i have been talking about this for a long time now pt is extrinsic pathway ptt is intrinsic pathway one of the very important point which is not related here is factor 8 factor 8 deficiency lead to hemophilia disease so they will ask 
by giving you one clinical picture of hemophilia and they can ask which of the following test is done okay to confirm the diagnosis of hemophilia and they want the answer of aptt first and after aptt is prolonged then we go for factor 8 assay always aptt is done first if i add a in the beginning it is activated partial thromboplastin time but some of the textbook directly mention ptt you know it doesn't matter another is fibrinogen fibrinogen is decrease in dic because of consumption again and antithrombin 3 and protein c they are also reduced these are called anticoagulant factor these are naturally occurring anticoagulant factors okay so their role is also there in in a pathogenesis of dic whenever there is excessive thrombus going on or developing then these factors also play active role uh, to dissolve that thrombus or they do not allow that thrombus to occur this is like a compensatory mechanism of our body okay but the procoagulant factors are overwhelming in an increase amount than anticoagulant factor so thrombosis will win ultimately in this type of situation now thrombocytopenia so what is the normal level of platelet what is the normal value or normal level of platelet yes who can answer this to me sir it is 150 to 450 uh, uh, 7.5 to 4.5 like platelets per microliter of blood okay good so he is saying 1.5 okay uh, uh, to 4 lakh per microliter or you, if you don't want to say in lakh you know this lakh is is the unit which is not commonly used all over the world so you can say 150000 to 400000 per microliter never forget this this is the level of platelet in our blood so lesser than the lower value is called thrombocytopenia in clinical practice we usually take at take it take it as 100000 though the lower level is 150000 but we are not too concerned when platelet is still higher than that 100000 level okay now if they ask you why thrombocytopenia is seen in uh, dic you can say this is because of the consumption now fibrinogen degradation product or fibrin degradation product you can say also known as d dimer assay we have talked about this during the conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin these products are mainly formed okay so they are increasingly formed or excessively formed in case of dic because clottings are or blood clots are formed everywhere so if we uh, analyze the level okay and if we find they are excessively higher than the normal value then we can almost confirm this is a case of dic So this is the meaning now okay see that regarding the thrombocytopenia we already talked about regarding the fibrin degradation product and d dimer let let us add few more thing here fdp are hepatically and renally metabolized so liver and kidney will handle them so hepatic and renal dysfunction may lead to falsely elevated fibrin degradation product so we need to make sure liver and kidneys are functioning well in case of hepatic failure like cirrhosis of the liver or renal failure okay then they may be falsely high they they are measured by d dimer assay d dimer assay means monoclonal antibodies to d dimer fragment you don't need to know in this much detail just know fibrin degradation product and d dimer will be abnormal in case of dic one of the very very important test now what about fibrinogen the fibrinogen is the first clotting factor or coagulation factor so it is very commonly used to diagnose and monitor dic the sensitivity of a low fibrinogen level for the diagnosis of dic is only 28% okay so this alone probably would not diagnose dic but we never do it alone we do a battery of test and if if we combine all the report of those test then the diagnosis can be easily okay uh, easily confirmed 
for example, platelet count would be low. Okay. Bleeding time is prolonged. Clotting time is prolonged. PT is prolonged. APTT is prolonged. Fibrinogen is decreased and FDP is increased. So if we combine all these tests together, only one diagnosis comes in our mind, that is DIC. So this is the way you need to learn. Fibrinogen is a protein. So it is an acute phase reactant. So it may be falsely normal in DIC. Now, one of the important point I like to highlight here, what are the other example of acute phase reactant? Yes, anybody? C-reactive protein. protein. Good, one is C-reactive protein, very good. Anything else? S protein. Yes. Okay. Now listen here. Yeah, this is a little bit difficult question for you. So let me, you know, highlight uh, this here. Acute phase reactant. These are the special type of proteins which are elevated, okay, in inflammation and infection in the body. Now see here. Uh, one is CRP. Definitely, C-reactive protein. It is called acute phase reactant. Another is any type of similar protein, like in some of the textbook, even it is mentioned ferritin. Ferritin is a type of acute phase reactant. And measurement of ESR is okay, acute phase reactant. This ESR would be elevated in case of inflammation and infection. So you can easily mention ESR, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, as one of the marker of acute phase reactant as well. In case of anemia, okay, in case of anemia, what happens to ESR? Anybody? What happens to ESR in case of anemia? Who can answer this? Increases. Increase. ESR will be increased in uh, anemia. Very good. ESR is always increased. Okay. So uh, in, in this type of bleeding situation also, okay, it may be increased. It may be increased or it may be normal. It depends. Uh, in medicine, it is never like a hundred percent of the situation. It differs by so many different factors. Even if we, if we are talking about that particular disease, different factors, okay, will affect the lab value. So we need to always remember this. Our patient do not follow whatever is described in the textbook. So our mind should be very open. If some certain lab value comes to us, you know, we should always ask the question, why I am thinking about some other type of lab value? Why it is not following that pattern? So this type of question has to be asked and try to find out the answer. Sometimes the lab value are wrong also. If the lab is not very reliable, these values are wrong. So if we cannot find any answer, so what I do now, I'll repeat the test. I'll send the test again, okay? And look for the second value of the test. These are the important practical information. Now, hypofibrinogenemia is detected in very severe cases of DIC. This means very low level of fibrinogen. And, you know, it is relatively decreased in acute DIC, but variable in chronic DIC. So these are some of the important points. Now, these are relatively, uh, uh, you know, easier slides for you because most of the things we have already discussed before. So let's repeat again. PT and PTT. Now, PT measures intrinsic pathway. PTT measures extrinsic pathway. Is it, is it right or is it written in a wrong way? Yes? Sir, it is written in the wrong way. Sir, PT is for extrinsic pathway and PTT is for intrinsic pathway. Any other student also thinks this is written in the wrong way? Yes, I want to hear a few more answers here. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. It is written wrong way. See there? So just now, two, two slides ago, I asked the same question and you have answered it confidently, okay? So this is written in the wrong way. So please correct it. PT measures extrinsic pathway. PTT measures intrinsic pathway. 
Now, PT and PTT are prolonged in 50 to 60 percent of DIC cases. There's no doubt about it. In majority of the cases, they are prolonged because the coagulation factors are consumed. They are consumed. So we can use PT and PTT to monitor DIC. Please mute yourself. Somebody is causing trouble there, noise. PT increase in acute DIC and, or it may be normal or slightly increase in chronic DIC. We are not concerned about that. It should, should be increased. And PTT is increase in acute DIC and normal or sometimes in chronic DIC also. So these are some of the important points. So one statement is PT and APTT are usually increased in the case of DIC. Now, another important point from the pathogenesis of DIC is microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. This occurs because of the occlusion of the blood vessels, very small capillaries inside the different organ because of thrombosis. So when RBC passes through them, their surface, the cell membrane of those RBC would be damaged and they are removed from the circulation. This is the pathogenesis of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. Now, how do we diagnose it? Okay, by the lab test. So see here, if we do peripheral smear, we can see cystocyte. Cystocyte, these are the special uh, appearing cells of the RBC. Increased serum LDH. LDH is lactate dehydrogenase. Now, lactate dehydrogenase is the enzyme which is present in most of the cells of our body. So RBCs are the cell which we are talking here. When RBCs are lies or destroyed, LDH comes out and it will be raised in the blood. So this is a non-specific marker of hemolysis. But you should never understand like this. Whenever LDH is high, only hemolysis is the cause. I'm not saying that. LDH is high in so many other type of disorders because it is very non-specific type of enzyme which is present in many different cells. Now, decreased serum haptoglobin. Now, what is haptoglobin? Who can answer this? Proteins by hemoglobin. Okay, good. It is a protein. So it is encoded by the uh, HP gene in blood plasma cell. Okay. So what is the function? What is its function? It binds to feed hemoglobin. It binds to feed hemoglobin. So it binds to feed hemoglobin. Very good. Okay. Now, um, I'm getting the correct answer. Haptoglobin is a protein. Haptoglobin is a protein which binds free hemoglobin. So it acts as a transfer protein for free hemoglobin. Now, let's come to the topic. This is a case of DIC. This is a case of hemolytic anemia. So there will be free hemoglobin in the blood. That free hemoglobin will bind with haptoglobin and the level of free haptoglobin will be reduced. So we can utilize this as a diagnostic point of hemolytic anemia. It is seen in other type of hemolytic anemia also, not only here. Now, this microangiopathic hemolytic anemia is commonly seen renal or malignant disease. One of the important, uh, you know, or some of the important causes of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, I like to highlight here again, though we have already talked this in the previous classes also. HUS is hemolytic uremic syndrome, TTP, okay, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, DIC. That's what we are learning right now. These are very, very important causes. Now, cystocyte okay, are the fragmented RBC and they are one of the important indicator of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. They are fragmented type of RBC because the cell membrane of these are damaged and ultimately those damaged RBC cannot survive longer, remember? they are removed by reticular endothelial system of our body. So these are cystocyte. Now one important message to you, if they ask you, cystocytes are the hallmark of which of the following situation, and if they give different examples of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, they are present in all of them. They are present in all of them, like HUS, 
like TTP or even DIC. But if there is only microangiopathic hemolytic anemia mentioned there, or any one of the example of this mentioned, then they are uh, you know seeking that answer. So you need to be clever enough. Antithrombin three and protein C. Now these are often reduced in DIC, and we 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 do not you know usually go for this type of test, isn't it? We usually do not go for this type of test. But if we do, they have been shown to have prognostic significance. Prognosis means chance of cure or what is the chance of complication. All those information will be provided. Now, okay, let's move on. Now, see here, to, to diagnose uh, this uh, DIC, okay, the International Society for Thrombosis and Hemostasis has devised a DIC scoring system so that the diagnosis can be done uh, relatively easily. Now let's talk about these things quickly. Please mute yourself. Okay. Now see there. So what are the prerequisite or what are the essential things before we go on to this scoring system? First is patient must have underlying disorder which is known to be associated with DIC. Now, all those causes which we have listed, that is a prerequisite and the sensitivity and specificity of this DIC scoring system is 91% and 97%. So this is a wonderful type of scoring system. This is a very high sensitivity and specificity. Okay, now let's talk about it. So this is a, a DIC scoring system. Okay, so first is a risk assessment. So this is the way, does the patient have an underlying disorder known to be associated with overt DIC? Overt means frank DIC. The clinical features are visible there and the lab features are very obvious. This is overt or frank. Now, there may be two answers, isn't it? Yes, we order global coagulation test. Like these are the one, platelet count, prothrombin time, okay, activated partial thromoplastin time, fibrinogen and fibrin degradation product. If there is no okay, uh, underlying disorder, do not use this algorithm. The algorithm will not be used here. Now see this, these are the score. These are the results. The platelet count, okay, more than 100, okay, 1000 per microliter. This is 100,000 per microliter. This is zero. This is a score of zero. Okay, let's move on. So less than 100,000 per microliter is a score of one and less than 50,000 is a score of two. Now, so many times we, we talked about this, and the platelet count will be low in DIC. So if it is very low, then the score would be higher. If it is just low, the score would be one. If it is more than 100,000 per microliter, and we consider it normal, so it's score is zero. That is the one. Elevated fibrin degradation product or D-dimer. So no increase, zero. Moderately increase two, strongly increase three. Prolonged prothrombin time, less than three seconds, zero. More than three, but less than six seconds, one. And more than six seconds, two. Now you may be wondering, what is this three second and six second here? The normal value of prothrombin time is around 12 to 14 seconds. So what is it? Uh, what is the meaning here? Now, if it is just higher by three seconds, or higher by six seconds, or still lesser than six seconds than the normal. That is the meaning. That's how you understand here. For example, in this patient, the control value of PT is 12 seconds. So in this patient, it is just 14 seconds. That means it is not higher by three seconds. So it is zero. So we consider that is okay. That is not a very, you know, uh, problematic in case of DIC, like that you understand. And fibrinogen level, more than one gram per liter is zero, less than one gram per liter is one. Now, we calculate the score, okay, and we add all the, you know, parameter 
with the score if it is equal or more than 5 equal or more than 5 it is compatible with cobalt dic if it is less than 5 it is suggestive for non over dic or probably it it may be some other diagnosis okay it may be usually non overt or hidden type of dic the lab features are positive but clinical features are still not coming so a bit of chronic sort of dic and uh, sometimes even other diagnosis may be there now what are the complications of dic what can happen to the patient as a result of disseminated intravascular coagulation so few of the uh, 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 complication every student can list so how i remember this hemorrhage is a very important complications of dic so anyone can tell that another is thrombosis and remember if this thrombosis occurs in in our major organ then those organ will suffer so just remember the name of the organ and then think about what happens to them now with this just just pay attention here stroke if thrombosis occurs in the intracerebral blood vessel stroke can happen so what is a stroke yes anyone stroke means what sir the stroke occurs when the blood supply to a part of brain is interrupted or it some part of the brain, brain infarction okay so now very good very good good so see that many students are answering and all of them are correct so let me combine the answers together if an area of our brain has not received blood supply either because of ischemia or because of hemorrhage there will be development of neurological dysfunction or deficit this is called stroke so so many different way you can answer a stroke is sudden neurological deficit which is developed by lack of blood flow or rupture of a blood vessel inside area of the brain this is the way ischemia of vital organ cardiac tamponade when there is bleeding in the pericardial cavity cardiac tamponade occurs tamponade is a pressure effect okay to the heart renal failure can occur liver dysfunction can occur pulmonary embolism and pulmonary infarction can occur respiratory distress because of damage of the lung shock because of excessive bleeding or because of the related cause for example infection is one of the very important cause of dic infection can lead to septic shock and after dic occur the patient may bleed excessively leading to hemorrhagic or hypovolemic shock you see this this is the connection and death can happen because this is a very serious condition now we have reached to the last part of this big topic but very very important one that is treatment so treatment of dic if they ask this question okay, you can answer a uh, symptomatic and supportive treatment as well as definitive treatment now definitive treatment is treat the underlying disorder whatever disease is causing dic you go for the treatment of that and for the symptomatic and supportive treatment what is happening in the body okay so you treat accordingly that is the meaning now let's proceed further if actively bleeding or needs invasive procedure and platelet is less than 50000 we transfuse with platelet now, actively bleeding definitely platelet transfusion is necessary and if platelet is less than 50000 in this type of situation there is high chance of hemorrhage okay and invasive procedure means uh, for example intubation for example endoscopy for example some catheterization some uh, lumbar puncture okay but this this type of invasive procedure is very risky in this situation i am just giving you example of invasive procedure if non bleeding patient consider the threshold okay 10000 before transfusing the patient is not bleeding we are not too much concerned 
till the platelet reaches 10,000 okay, per microliter. 10,000 is very scary limit. Remember, very low platelet. But if patient is not bleeding, okay, we are not too concerned. But if it is, uh, uh, you know, uh, even lesser than 10,000, then we need to transfuse. This is the dose of the platelet. One unit of platelets per 10 kg is transfused. You don't need to know that in detail now. Okay, if some students are interested, then they can remember. And another is fresh frozen plasma, which is given in a dose of 15 ml per kg. Now, in fresh frozen plasma, there are lots of clotting factors and which are really necessary for the treatment. Severe hypofibrinogenemia. Okay, we need to give fibrinogen concentrate. We give cryoprecipitate or fibrinogen concentrate. It is available. And uh, if we uh, give this type of things, then we judge or we decide what is the effectiveness of this type of therapy. So how we uh, know it is effective by doing repeated type of test after a few hours, what is the, you know, uh, level of platelet? What is the level of uh, fibrinogen? What is the level of PT or APTT? Like that, we can decide whether some other treatment is necessary or the thing which you have given is enough for the time being. Let's move on. Now, another important uh, type of therapy is correction of the underlying condition. Already talked about, it depends on the causes. If septicemia or sepsis is the cause, it should be treated with IV antibiotics. They are broad spectrum IV antibiotic. Remember, gram negative microorganisms or bacteria are the commonest cause of sepsis and DIC. So we should include one important gram negative antibiotic. Now tell me, which antibiotic specifically acts against gram-negative bacteria? Which is that? Metronidazole. Okay. Gram-negative. That's my question. Okay. Good. One is septriaxone. One is septriaxone. Okay. So let me write this for you here. This is very important knowledge. The protoxins of uh, and fluorocannulones. Okay, gram negative sepsis. So we need to use certain antibiotics, and those antibiotics are aminoglycoside. Aminoglycosides. These are highly specific for gram negative bacteria. Then third generation. Okay, third generation cephalosporin. Uh, you know what are the example? Cephalosporins like ciprotaxims and septriaxone. These are very commonly used. Okay. There are so many other, so many. Then even fluoroquinolones is right. Fluoroquinolones, okay? Ciproproxacin and levoproxacin. Exactly. Fluoroquinolones. It should be LO. Okay, fluoroquinolones. Now somebody was telling me metronidazole. Metronidazole are mainly used for anaerobic organism. We don't answer. They are the drug for gram negative. They are the drug for anaerobe. Okay, yes, anaerobe can be gram negative. I'm not denying that. But you don't answer uh, metronidazole for gram negative bacteria. Okay, these are the correct answer. Very good. Now let's move on. If obstetric causes of DIC are there, then it often requires evacuation of the uterus, means termination of the pregnancy. If it is because of missed abortion, terminate it. Remove that dead baby from the uterus. If it is because of retained dead fetus, remove it. If it is because of abrosive placenta, deliver the placenta. Baby first and the placenta. So this will control the situation. If it is because of vascular abnormality, like aortic aneurysm or Casabac Merritt syndrome, then it should be treated surgically. Remove those aneurysm or big hemangioma. So these are the important points. Treat the cause, okay? This is one of the important part of DIC management. 
Okay, let's move on. Now, what's the role of anticoagulation therapy in DIC? There is a huge role. Now, drug like heparin, okay, low molecular weight heparin and warfarin, they are important drug. This is an acute type of condition we are talking about here now, acute DIC management. So, heparin and low molecular hep weight heparin is more important than warfarin. Warfarin is more important in chronic sort of DIC. Now, heparin partly inhibit the activation of coagulation in DIC. So, it is a very important drug. In critically ill, non-bleeding patient, especially with cancer patient, remember in cancer, there is a, a Trussu syndrome. Okay, Trussu syndrome means migratory type of thrombophlebitis or thromboembolism is seen. So, we have to give prophylactic doses of heparin or low molecular weight heparin. This is a conventional heparin. This is low molecular weight heparin, okay? So they have a certain difference there. Conventional heparin is only given intravenously. Low molecular weight heparin can be given subcutaneously also. It is very commonly be given even in OPD basis. Now, one important point okay, regarding the heparin treatment, the clinical randomized control trial, which have done all over the world, they have shown that giving heparin in patients with DIC okay, uh, doesn't improve the outcome. So the most important treatment is not uh, this one here uh, for the outcome. Probably that is treat the appropriate causes, whatever is causing the disease. Now we are towards the end of this topic. What are the differential diagnosis now? All the bleeding cases are not because of DIC. What are the other causes of bleeding disorder or clotting disorder? Some of the importance are mentioned here. Liver disease. Every student know in liver disease, there is lack of certain coagulation factor like 2, 7, 9, and 10. And as a result of this, there is high chance of hemorrhage. Any example you can take, especially the chronic type of liver disease like cirrhosis of the liver. Vitamin K deficiency, same thing. It also leads to bleeding because those factors 2, 7, 9, and 10, they need to be converted into the active clotting factor and vitamin K is very essential for that mechanism. Okay, now TTP, ITP, I can easily take this example here. Aplastic anemia, leukemia, all these, HUS means hemolytic uremic syndrome. So these are easily included as the differential diagnosis. So how to differentiate them from each other now? With the help of investigation. Now, regarding the prognosis of DIC, most of the patient, they often die of the underlying disease. For example, septicemia and septic shock, the death percentage is very high. The mortality of fulminant DIC has been reported to vary between 20 and 50%. So very serious condition. This is a high mortality rate. Even in the best centers around the world, the mortality rate is still high. Okay. And better prognosis is said to result from more aggressive therapy for the patients with acute DIC. Now remember, one of the examples of acute DIC is Waterhouse Fredrickson syndrome. Okay. Waterhouse Fredrickson syndrome in case of acute meningococcemia, also known as purpura fulminans. Now, if we, if we aggressively treat that condition, give a high dose of antibiotic, give good amount of IV fluids, okay, even use corticosteroid and all those things quite early, then we can save the life of that patient. Otherwise, the prognosis is really poor.